Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. This is Ann Mitchell, and I am here to present How Do I Know I'm Right? I have the little chat window up, so I will try and keep an eye on that as I talk, though I get lost in my presentation sometimes. So I may miss something that you say, but I will keep an eye on it. I'm really excited to do this one. I think one of the pieces that we miss sometimes, especially when we first get started, is how to analyze what we're doing and how to think about it. So what I wanted to do today was talk about what we call the proof standard and then walk through an example and show you things that you might want to look for when you're trying to decide if something is right or not. Now there's a lot of data that you're going to get when you build your family tree that's right or that it just really doesn't matter that much to you, right? I mean, if it's some, you know, brother or sister of a direct ancestor and whether their birth date is on 1875 or 1874 really doesn't make that much difference in your tree. But the example I'm gonna show you today when somebody's birth date is, it can make a big difference on who this person's father is. So you pick and choose, but knowing how to just go through the process and think about what you've done is really, really important. So let's get started. All right, so how do I know I'm right? Well, in genealogy, we have something called the genealogical proof standard. Sounds really formal, doesn't it? And it's gonna look sort of formal here, but it's really something that you can do. Anyone can do it. It has five components, a reasonably exhaustive, uh, goodness, a reasonably exhaustive search. And what that means is you have to look through all the data. It's not enough just to have one document. You really need more than one. Complete and accurate source citations. I've been doing a series on how to source and there's a good reason why we source. It's not because it's some tiresome work that we have to do to get points for. We do it for two reasons. One, so we know where something came from and we can find it again. Two, so that we can Analyze the validity of the actual data. How well does it answer what it is I'm trying to answer? What is the question I'm asking and how well does it answer it? Then we need analysis and correlation of the collected information. Resolution of any conflicting evidence. And this is where the crux of the matter is, right? A lot of times you bring in a bunch of documents, everything falls in nicely together, you're happy, life goes on and then a soundly reasoned, coherently written conclusion. Now, most of you are not gonna write soundly reasoned, coherently written conclusions. You're not even gonna write incoherent conclusions. But if you get enough data together, you'll be able to piece it together in your head, and then you'll be able to understand what's going on. All right, so let's look at the example. All right, so we're going to look today at the case of Otto Baxter Payne, and when was he born? So the first record that I might pull up, and this is, these are just beautiful images. Um, this is his registration card for, <clears throat> excuse me, World War II. And as you can see here, it says that he was 19 years and he was born December 16th, 1922. That actually looks like it could be a 1922 or a 1923. So if I go to the second card, and I don't have the whole second card here, but if I have that, what it says is June 30th, 1942. Perfect. I do some basic subtraction. And I always do my subtraction of years in Family Tree Maker. They have a nice little calculator because I don't like to do all that in my head. I get confused. So subtraction tells us that if he was 19 on June 30th, 1942, he was born in 1922. Good. Life is good. All right, let's collect some more information because we're doing an exhaustive search. You wanna look at everything we have on auto. According to his tombstone, his death certificate, and his obituary, he was born on December 16th, 1923. So you can see his tombstone here. We know this is him. He was in World War II. He was in Korea, and there is his tombstone. Then if we look down here on the uh, index of the death collection, we'll notice that, and you may have a hard time reading that, but trust me, it says 1923. U.S. Veterans Grave Sites. 
1923. Obituary, he, he was 75 when he died on November 3rd, 1999. If you do subtraction, lo and behold, he was born in 1923. We have a conflict. All right, that may not be that big of a deal, right? Well, in this particular case, it is. Because James Robert Payne is Otto's father. Eva Georgia Payne is Otto's mother. James died on January 5th, 1923. And if Otto was born on December 16th, 1922, James is his father. If he was born in 1923, unless Eva had a very long pregnancy, I don't think James is his father. So this is actually something that we need to figure out. All right, so here's the proof I have for James Payne. He was born, or he died in 1923, and I also have his death certificate. Now let's think about these two pieces of information here. The death certificate, when it comes to when James Robert Payne died, is probably a very accurate thing, right? On a death date, a death certificate, it's an official document. It was reported at the time of his death. The person who reported it had direct knowledge of his death, right? So we can feel really, really good about that. All right, so now let's go back and let's evaluate what we have for Otto. He has four records that say he was born on December 16th, 1923. He has an obituary, a tombstone, a veteran's record, and a North Carolina death index. He has one record that says he was born in 1922, his draft registration. So four is greater than one. I've heard this theory out there that when you have three pieces of evidence that answer a question and they all say the same thing, then they must be right, right? No, that's not how that works. It is not the greatest number wins here. We're not, it's not a democracy, we're not voting. We're looking for data that we actually think is valid. One thing you'll notice about all the records that he has that say he was born in 1923, they're all related to his death. And if you think about this, he died when he was 75 years old. When he was 75 years old, and he was the youngest, I think, of eight children, there was probably no one around who was there at his birth, right? There was nobody there who was around at his birth who was actually aware of his birth. There may be a sister or brother who was there, but they were probably very, very young. So anyone who has this information and reported it may have actually, well, they're secondary. It's secondary information, right? They don't know exactly. They weren't there at his birth. This computer is really slow today. All the records that we have saying he was born in 1923 are death records. And like I said, it's very doubtful the person reporting the information was there. For the draft registration, Otto was there at his own birth. Well, that's good, but I suspect he doesn't remember it. Well, I know I don't remember my own birth, but it is closer to the date, so it probably has more validity. Now, someone suggested, I saw that in the chat, that maybe he lied to get into the war. And that very well could have been. But he would have been 19 or 18 and when he registered if you go back to that document he was a senior in high school i'm sure he didn't go until after he graduated so well i'm not sure of that but i'm guessing that but even at 18 he could have enlisted and probably gone so i don't think he had any reason to lie there now if it was something that made him 18 instead of 17 yes that might be true i think we need to do some more looking because the more information we can gather, the better decision we're going to make. All right, so also on Ancestry, I have found the North Carolina birth register. And this is going to be sort of hard to read. But if you look right here, 
Certificate 62 on 1922, December 15th, Otto Baxter Payne was born to James Robert Payne and Eva S. Baxter. Well, this is interesting. 1922, right? I'm all done. There's nothing else I need to look at. Well, you can probably guess since we're doing this as an example that may or may not be true. You have to look closely. Could it be possible it was copied wrong? Let's think about some things here. If we look up here at the top, and this may be hard to read, but the first years are 1923, and they're all in Bessemer City. 1923, then we go to 1922, 1922 in the same city. Well, that's sort of odd. They do 1923 and 1922. Then we're over here in Cherryville, that's 1922. 1922, two in Crowder's Mountain, one in March 1922, one in December 1922. So I do believe it is possible, though I don't know for sure, this could have been copied wrong, right? It could have been 1923. So, and another thing that we notice over here, it says James Robert Payne, and it gives the mother's name as Eva S. Baxter. Now, the thing that makes me think that that was copied wrong is it was Eva Georgia, or Georgie, she often went by. So it was Eva Georgia Baxter. So why, it's not S, it's a G, and she often went by that name. So we do know this was copied from somewhere else. What we really need to do at this point is to look at more about this data collection. And if you look at the actual data collection, we always have a description if you go to the data collection page. And it says on here, if you go down here, with the information provided in this index, you may be able to obtain a copy of a birth or death certificate. It is possible, oh, excuse me, if possible, it's important that you do this because often more information is provided in an original record than is provided in the index. This is not the original record then. Some birth registers are the the source of truth, at least the best that we've got. This particular one is not, and it's important when you source and cite your pieces of evidence and information that you look at this and you understand, is this the original if it's a copy? Every time something's copied, you have a chance for things to be messed up. It's easy enough to do. So let's keep looking. All right, so what I'm looking at here and I'm gonna blow up the important part here in a second, is the estate record for James Robert Payne when he died in 1923. And I found this one on Family Search, but this is an actual copy of the record as it was recorded in the book. And if I look at the top of this, it says, in the amount of the, in the matter of the administration of the estate of James Robert Payne, and it goes on and talks about things, then it says, then it talks about who are the entitled as heirs and distributees thereof. What that means is these are all the people who are heirs of James Robert Payne. And he died in test state. And what that means is he died without a will. And since he died without a will, it has to list all his legal heirs here. All right, so let's read these real quick. Georgia Payne, that's the wife, and here are the children. Layla, Boyce, Jenny, Floyd, Tommy, Robert, and Daisy. And if you look at that on the 1920 census, these are indeed all the brothers and sisters of Otto. Well, Daisy's not listed on that one, but she is there. There's no Otto on this record. That really, really strikes me as odd. This document was written in March 15, 1923. Now, it is possible, very possible, that, I mean, there was a lot of grief going on. You know, this woman, this woman is my great-grandmother. You know, maybe they just forgot to write one down. Her brother and another relative are witnesses on this document. Maybe they just didn't notice. Things happen, right? But this is a legal document, and usually you write everything down. Somebody double-checks it and whatnot. So one does have to wonder, when was Otto born? And is there a missing piece here? So let's go back. 
What is it we do when we want to prove something? We do a reasonably exhaustive search. We've been searching. The only thing we haven't discovered here is the birth certificate. We've looked at all in the complete and accurate source citations. We've looked at our documents. We've thought about them. We love the... We liked that we went through and we saw the, you know, where they came from. We analyzed them, all that good stuff. We looked at the analysts and correlation of the collected information. We thought about it. We put it in, you know, which one is more accurate. And the resolution of any conflicting evidence. And right now we still have quite a bit of conflicting evidence. So I don't think we've come up with an answer yet. Now, I don't actually have the birth certificate but from what i know and from other things that i've seen he was actually born in 1922 he was just left off the estate record but you can see we're going through all these things and all this conflicting evidence you really do have to search to find the actual answer and this is fairly important because what we're doing in family history is we want to determine kinship and knowing who someone's father is or who their mother is is important to doing the whole tree, right? And if it wasn't possible for James to be Otto's father, well, then that's a family mystery that would have to be solved. So, when you're really trying to prove something, when you see something in your tree that makes you feel, well, that must be true that, it's, that he was born in 1922 because James must be his father. You really have to dig into the evidence. You really have to find as many pieces of documentation as you can to know whether something's right or not. And that is the only way you can know. It isn't how many pieces of evidence you have that say one thing. You can, there can be all sorts of evidence. You can have 20 pieces of evidence that tell you something is right, but it may be the one that's different that's right, or it may be none of them. And it's what we do when we go through family history that helps us determine that. And when we go back to this document here, which is the estate record, Oops. what's important about this particular document, it's a legal document. It has to state all the heirs for legal reasons. And this happened fairly close to his death. It happened two months after his death. This document really helps us understand whether Otto was alive at that time or not. But even though we think this is probably the most accurate document, his birth certificate actually shows he was just left off. So there you go. You just never know until you have everything all put together. Now this one was a little bit complicated. And there are some cases that are not as complicated. But the idea here is you always need to do a reasonably exhaustive search. Find every document you can think of that will help you find the answer. Look at every document and get a complete and accurate source citation. The reason being, you need to evaluate the actual information and you need to understand who gave you that information. Then pull all the data together and analyze and correlate them. Look at them and compare them. Resolve any conflicting evidence. Why might something be different? Why might something be wrong? You all came up with some really good points. I was watching the crawl. Maybe he lied to get into the Army at that time, or the Air Force. Maybe he you know, changed his age at some point to get Social Security. You know, There could be all sorts of reasons to get married, all sorts of reasons why these things would happen. And then once you get that done, you can write a soundly reasoned, coherently written conclusion, or at least reasonably well written. So always ask yourself when you're trying to figure something out, have I done an exhaustive search? Is there, enough is there another piece of information that might help? And on this one, we would say no at this point. We would need the birth certificate. Sometimes they're not available. You always need to check the state that you're in and make sure the birth certificates existed for that time. In North Carolina, they started being published in 1913. So that does exist. And you should, another good one, and I saw somebody mention this in the crawl earlier, I, you should check newspapers that in that area for birth announcements. <clears throat> they may not exist, but if they do, that's also another clue. So if you don't know the answer, keep digging. Sometimes you have to go with your best guess. Sometimes there's just not a good answer, but the answer is you keep digging. One piece of information is not enough. 
All right, so coming up, Krista's gonna end out the month for us in our events. She is doing not one, not two, but three family tree makers coming, uh, events coming up. The first one is about tools. If you have family tree maker, it's going to be very useful. Uh, reports, also very, very useful. And then places, understanding where people lived and where they were during certain events and being able to draw that together, also very useful. And then on Friday, September 28th, she will be doing a tweet chat where she will answer your questions. And then we will be rolling out our October events. I hope you guys found this interesting and I'm sure I will talk to you next month. I'll stay on chat if you guys have questions. Thank you so much.